Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the second of our series, Leading Voices in Politics and Policy. Uh, we are very privileged here to have one of the um, uh, great uh, sons of Dartmouth, uh, also Secretary of the Treasury, happens to be Secretary of Treasury. Most importantly, he's Dartmouth class of 1983, uh, with us today. But I want to just talk for just a few seconds about the lecture series. We have many other speakers uh, coming uh, over the next uh, uh, several weeks. And this is our effort um, to uh, begin the process of thinking about utilizing our summers to have conversations. And we, the entire sophomore class, as many of you may know, is here uh, for the summer. And so we uh, are, are trying out the, um, uh, the method of having great speakers come address the entire sophomore class, plus members of our community, and having a communication, uh, and communicating and, and, and having a discussion across an entire class. So we're very excited about um, uh, the process. There'll be many announcements going forward. And so I just, my role today is very simple. I just am going to uh, introduce uh, our, um, our, our two speakers today. Andrew Sand Samwick is the Sandra L. and Arthur L. Irving 72A Parent 10 Professor of Economics. He's the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and the Social Sciences at Dartmouth College. He is also an instructor for Public Policy 20, Contemporary Issues in American Politics and Public Policy, which is the anchor course for this lecture series. Our guest speaker is Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Treasury, uh, Tim Geithner. On January 26, 2009, Tim Geithner was sworn in as the 75th Secretary of the United States Department of the Treasury. Before this nomination, Secretary Geithner was the ninth president and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where he began service on November 17, 2003. In that capacity, he served as Vice Chairman and a permanent member of the Federal Open Market Committee, the group responsible for formulating the nation's monetary policy. Secretary Geithner graduated from Dartmouth College in the great class of 1983. Secretary Geithner's family has said that he's an avid athlete and known to turn up at business meetings in Europe wearing ski boots and to start pickup basketball games with colleagues in his New York office. That is a Dartmouth uh, grad there for you. That's our kind of guy. So without further ado, Professor Andrew Samwick and Secretary of the Treasury, Timothy Geithner. It's a, it's a Friday afternoon. Why are you here? <laughs> Don't get a swelled head just yet, okay? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. It's a distinct pleasure to have the Treasury Secretary with us. Uh, it falls to me to give some ground rules for today's activities. Uh, mostly it concerns the part of the program that'll be questions and answers from the audience. I'd like to stipulate three things. The first, those asking questions should ask only one question each. Secondly, that out of consideration for others waiting to ask questions, the question should be reasonably brief. And number three, that it ought to be a question rather than a statement or a commentary. I'll take advice. You can offer advice if you want. You may get more than you bargained <laughs> for with that. As is my prerogative, I'm going to ask at least one or two questions to start us off. The first is that I think maybe we could all understand something better about fiscal policy if we knew what the target was. Uh, earlier this week, the Congress. You're going to really begin with economics? <laughs> if I don't, who will? Dismal dark, <laughs> dismal dark science. OK, go ahead. Uh, so the CBO released its long-term budget outlook this week. It pointed to a 9.3% of GDP budget deficit for the current year and the expectation that the debt to GDP ratio will be near 70% by the end of the year. Public discussion about the budget uh, is sometimes confounded by the lack of knowing what we're aiming at. So I wonder if you would start us off today by talking about what the targets are within the administration for both the long-term and the short-term budget. Excellent question. So our basic objective is to return the country to living within its means again. What does that mean? And for a country, uh, certainly like the United States today, but really for any country, at a minimum, what it means is you get the deficit down low enough 
So you'd start to bring down the overall debt burden as a share of the economy. You gotta prevent it from rising too far, but mostly you gotta make sure you're putting it on a downward path. Now for us, given the structure of our economy, what that means is we have to get our deficit down from about 10% of GDP to below 3% of GDP, and we have to hold it there over time. And if we do that, then the overall debt burden as a share of our economy, measured the way we think we should measure, debt held by the public, would stabilize in the 70s as a percent of GDP and then start to come down gradually. So that's the basic math of it. But that's not, that's the necessary thing, but it's not really the hardest thing and it's not really the most important thing. The most important thing is, is, is how you do it. It's the, it's the composition of the reforms and the savings because it's the composition that will affect the ultimate incentives for investment. Uh, It'll affect the capacity we have to invest in things that matter for how we grow in the future. It'll affect the incentives for how we use health care, how people save for retirement. And the composition is important, not just politically, because ultimately you have to figure out a way to do this that's politically acceptable, but you have to do it in a way that's uh, fundamentally judged as fair uh, and good for the economy. And that target you began with, which is what's the objective, which an economist would say it's, it's primary modest primary surplus achieved in three to five years and then sustained uh, that basic objective is embraced now by a Democratic president, by the Republican leadership, by the only bipartisan budget agreement we have, which is the simpson Bowles Fiscal Commission. All have the same basic framework for the objective, at least for the next three to five years. And when you have that, that's good, because then when people agree on the objectives, you can fight about the composition, and we're having a big fight about the composition. But that's the first step. And when we last did a significant, meaningful fiscal deal in the United States, it was in the 95-96 in the period. And what made that possible is when then President Clinton decided to join what was then a broad Republican imperative to say, we're going to balance the budget. And when you had you know, those parts of the American political spectrum come together and say, we have to do this, and the debate is just about how. Uh, then you've passed the most difficult step. So as you say, the target would be a mild primary surplus uh, when there's no other factors acting on the economy. Right. So you might say that a target would be to run a balanced budget or close to it over a complete business cycle. It seems like the way we do our budget policy is very asymmetric in that when it's a weak economy, there's almost no measure that we wouldn't pass in order to try to drive economic growth forward. But in the good times, there's a tendency to be a little careless and not run the surpluses that we would need to. Uh, That's you, possible uh, when your overall debt burden is much lower than it is today. It's possible when your star starting point running deficits structures are lower than they are today, but it's not possible today. And it's not gonna be possible for the next, um, for the next decade, really. We've lost the chance. We, you know, we squandered the surpluses we had at the beginning of the last decade, uh, spent them, uh, expanded the commitments by the government without paying for them, went out and borrowed trillions of dollars, dug ourselves a huge hole, and we no longer have the luxury of that kind of uh, uh, keep deferring it uh, approach to the future. So. Anything we do now is going to have to be subject to a much more constrained set of choices. And if we have uh, a negative surprise in the economy, again, sometime over that period of time, we'll have to, we're going to have to make it up. We may have to temporarily borrow. That's what governments do in a recession. But we'll have to, at some point, pay off that debt so we, so we stay on this path of, of sustainability. But again, the hard thing is about um, the debate we're having now, which is how to make sure you do this in a way that's going to be broadly acceptable. You know, how are you going to achieve reforms in long-term health care spending that uh, preserve the necessary commitment we make to seniors, give them the certainty of access to health care at some level in the future, but in a way that's more affordable? How do we change how people use medicine? This is what uh, your great president has made a life, lifetime study of how do we change the incentive for how people use medicine, deliver it so that we can make this affordable. That's hard. How do we get better outcomes out of our education system so we're more competitive? How do we make it more likely that people will come invest in this country on a larger scale so we're building more things in this country, not overseas? How do we 
make our tax system less distorted, more fair, uh, a better burden across things. Those are the those are the difficult political challenges. It's not fundamentally a problem of math and accounting. So I keep thinking back to uh, when the recession was first upon us and when it was pretty clear that something was going to have to be done. There was a mantra that was repeated often in Washington policy circles. Uh, it was about timely, targeted, and temporary. That's how you should do fiscal stimulus. And the people who were proponents of this were both not slouches and then eventually went on to serve in some pretty important places in government. Uh, the phrase may have originated with a column written by Gene Sperling. It was picked up and developed further in uh, Larry Summer's speech in December of 2007 at Brookings. A month later, uh, Doug Elmendorf, Jason Furman, all these people, uh, very senior and involved in Washington, wrote a primer on fiscal <coughs> stimulus. So I've wondered about timely, temporary, and targeted. To what extent do you feel that that's been the guidepost for how the Obama administration has tried to do fiscal stimulus? I think, I think we generally met that test, uh, given the constraints we operate on. But I think you should step back. You should step back for a second. Just look at the basic strategy that we embraced. We're forced to embrace to prevent a second Great Depression, and it was more than stimulus on the fiscal side. Uh, you know, we had the full arsenal of economic policy deployed as we as we needed to. You had very creative very aggressive, no precedent for it, actions by the Fed uh, to, uh, through monetary policy. We had a very aggressive program to recapitalize, restructure the financial system, open the pipes of credit so the economy was not starved for oxygen. And then we had a very substantial um, fiscal stimulus program. And you ultimately need all those things. They wouldn't have worked if you just used one of those, of those weapons. Uh, and the stimulus program was uh, very quick in terms of the, uh, s the speed of agreement on the plan, so it was definitely timely. Absolutely temporary. In fact, it's now, on the, it's now fading uh, quite dramatically in terms of the impulse it's providing the economy. Was it targeted enough? I mean, you know the balance. There was a bunch of tax cuts in there, although you wouldn't think it from the political rhetoric in the country today. Very substantial tax cuts, individuals and corporates. There was a substantial amount of infrastructure spending, which has slower spend out rates, but that made it more sustained. A range of other things in there. Uh, but you know, we, it's, it's, this is about governing. You know, the, the task of governing is to figure out how to, how to uh, reconcile the ideal, reconcile the ideal with what's feasible, given the political reality of the moment. And our judgment was we had to do as much as quickly as we could, because at that point, you know, the economy was really falling off the cliff. And, you know, Greenspan and Bernanke both said that the shock that hit the U.S. economy was larger in magnitude than the shock that caused the Great Depression. And at that point, it was gathering momentum in terms of the downturn. So we felt that we had to do as much as we could as quickly as we could. And you wouldn't look at any of this stuff and say it was perfect in design. Uh, so I wouldn't, I don't, wouldn't admit any test of what people in academics or in the markets might judge as, as ideal at the moment. Nothing in Washington would ever meet that test. But it so meant the critical test of doing as much force into the economy as quickly as possible. And you know, grow, this is really a remarkable thing. If you look at any history of financial crises, the speed with which growth went from negative to positive, the speed with which you've had stability come back to financial markets, cost of credit come down, equity prices, wealth start to rise again, uh, was incredibly quick relative to any experience we had. And if you look back at the cost of the things we did, I'll just take the finance sector example. You know, at one point we had $2.8 trillion in exposure to the financial system because of all the emergency things we did with uh, people estimating losses ultimately for the taxpayer. You know, some people said in the 500 to a trillion range. And if you look at the cost of this intervention that we designed, even conservatively today, it's going to be uh, less than 1% of GDP, less than one third the cost of the SNL crisis, and incredibly cost effective, uh, creative rescue of the financial system. Very politically difficult, damaging for the president, very damaging politically. You know, I said once that uh, 
because of what he did, we saved the financial system, but we lost the country doing it. But that, that's, the, that's the lesson of financial crises. If you, they, they burn and they cost trillions of dollars or lost output GDP, uh, take years to, to recover when politicians sit there inert and are willing to act because they're scared of the political consequences of it. And what the president did, which was the hardest thing to do, was to recognize that if he didn't do all that early on, nothing was going to be possible, and yet the political cost of all that stuff was going to be deeply damaging. So that's a long answer to your question. Was it timely, targeted, and temporary? Basically, yes. Uh, uh, could it have been designed better? Not a chance, given the constraints we were operating in at that time. So we learned uh, today that uh, the final estimate of first quarter GDP growth was 1.9% at an annual rate. That's down from a 3% number in the prior quarter. And you're hearing words like double dip recession coming about. Is timely, targeted, and temporary still the playbook if you mean, more you mean, action is needed? What now for policy, you mean? Uh, yes. Well, if, I, think, I think what's important to, to look at is you know, what is actually happening uh, to the American economy today. And you know, we've had roughly average growth rates since growth began about two years ago in the two and a half to three percent range. We started the year with people expecting the first half would be between three and four percent. It's gonna be more like two percent. Why is that? And what should we conclude from that? What can we do about that? It's mostly lower because we had the combination of oil prices uh, high, uh, catastrophic shock in Japan, terrible weather that pushed construction down, big unanticipated slowdown in defense spending, uh, a lot of concern about Europe, risk from Europe, and a bit of tightening of policy in the most rapidly growing parts of the world. That's a lot of things hit the economy all at once. And most of the slowdown we've seen so far you can explain by those those specific factors and their cumulative effect. Uh, the risk in them, of course, is that weakness accumulates and people still scarred by the damage of the, of the recession. The crisis is still so tentative to pull back because of that. But I think most people look at the economy today and say that um, the underlying trend is still getting gradually stronger and they think the second half will be stronger and hopefully that's the case. I think the most important thing we can do in Washington now is bring to earth quickly a sensibly designed, balanced, comprehensive long-term fiscal plan that's structured in a way that's, that's good for growth over time. If we do that, then we can turn our attention to all the other challenges facing the country. So there are many, because unemployment is still very high. Uh, we have huge challenges as a country, but we, there is no path to addressing those challenges politically or economically or financially until people have more confidence that we can get our arms around this unsustainable fiscal problem put it on a more sustainable path, demonstrate to people that this political system can uh, put the country back to living with this means we'll abandon uh, all the bad practices of the last decade, reimpose some basic disciplines and constraints. And if we do that, then we'll have more room uh, to turn to these other challenges still facing the economy. So let's turn to politics, which I think is occupying a lot more of your day than the economics might be. Um, I look, and I think my students look at this, uh, political wrangling over the debt limit. It seems like maybe it's a technicality of some sort, and somehow that it has been inflated in, in, in importance. And my students are too young maybe to pose the question this way, but I understand you were a government major when you were at Dartmouth, and a focus on East Asia, if I'm remembering correctly. So no, you have a world view. No of this. economics, just one economics course, unfortunately. Yeah, well. <laughs> one is in fact enough if you do it right. I, I took some later to try to make up for that, but not but not here. Right. So the the question I would ask, and, and maybe you'll just indulge me on it, because maybe it's just a question I have. Would we be engaging in what I would refer to as partisan shenanigans over raising the debt ceiling? in the era that I grew up in, or when I was the age of the students today, it was the Cold War. I can't imagine this nonsense happening on Capitol Hill if we were still facing what we perceive to be a well-armed existential threat. We are fighting, uh, you know, we're fighting in combat. We Americans, uh, well, let me, let me state this more carefully. Uh, we're still a nation at war in many ways. 
I don't know, so what, what is all this about? I mean, I think you all know this. If you look at this, we run out of borrowing uh, capacity uh, in early August, August 2nd. And nobody ever in Congress likes to vote to raise the debt limit. So to raise the debt limit, to get the votes for that, people want to say they voted for something that restores some responsibility to the fiscal position. Totally reasonable thing. Uh, and so we're trying to negotiate that. There's a little danger in this because uh, very unpopular vote. And as you've seen, you know, cutting spending and raising taxes is not popular either. You combine those two things together, it's not necessarily easier. And there is a big risk of miscalculation now because there are a lot of people uh, on both sides of the American political spectrum now that would rather have a fight than actually do something. And there's a lot of people who are living with this illusion, it's a dangerous illusion that somehow if we defaulted on our debt, stopped paying our obligations, that'd be the way to balance our, our budget. No responsible person believes that. And the leadership of the Congress understand that's not possible. And so we'll have to work this out. And, and I think it's important that even the Speaker of the House and the, and the minority in the Senate, uh, those Republican leaders have said they want to get this done as quickly as possible so that we don't put the country in the position of um, taking too long and, and causing concern around the world that America might decide that it won't meet its obligation. That's not, not something we can come It would be devastating to the economy to let that concern build up. So we, we have to work this out. Uh, what, why, why is it so uh, divided now, divisive now? You know, the politics are terrible now. Um, of course, if you read about American history, um, I'm reading Moynihan's letters. Uh, it wasn't so great then. If you read about, uh, you know, Hamilton's time in office, it was, it was terrible then too. It feels pretty bad now though. <laughs> and you know, the, the country, country is very divided, very ambivalent about government, huge loss of faith in public institutions, uh, and the crisis caused a lot more damage to faith in public institutions. No trust, I think, really, in the overall quality of judgment. Um, and that makes it much harder, I think, for people to be willing to take risks, to work together. And, um, but that's ultimately what we're going to have to do. You know, we have to find a way to rebuild some confidence that uh, Washington can solve problems and that and even in a divided country, there are things we can do together, work together, without solving those deep ideological divides. And that's what this debate's about. It's, it's the ultimate test of the political system. Uh, when you're faced with a difficult challenge like this, can you find a way to get people to come together and, and try to solve something practical? And if we can do that, I think we'll help repair some of the damage done to, to confidence. I think it'd be good for the economy, good for people's confidence around the world in the United States. Uh, but we gotta earn that confidence. You do seem to be remarkably calm for somebody who is facing what you're facing over the next six weeks. You know, people say this to me, they say, boy, why do you look so calm? But I explained to them that, um, you know, this, this country, uh, in the period between really the summer of 07 and the first half of 09, was really on the edge of a catastrophic collapse. It was really reasonable prospect. It would be like the, the Great Depression again. And uh, nothing we face today is as difficult or as challenging as what we went through to avoid that outcome. Nothing is as challenging as that. And you know, there's a lot of politics now, but these are manageable problems for us as a country. There's no reason why we can't solve them. We know how to solve them. It just takes a little will. And you're gonna, you know, you should be patient. You're gonna see a lot of political theater around this in the next couple weeks. And there'll be, you know, six episodes of failure uh, before people do the right thing. <laughs> well, that's great, thank you. I think what I'd like to do. <laughs> is uh, maybe turn the program over to the audience for some questions. Our custom here is that we have ushers with microphones who come through the aisles. And if I could have you start sort of closer to the front of the auditorium, that would be great, because uh, I see a lot of our students. I think, I think the president should be ineligible. <laughs> you can say that. I was really struck hearing that you only took one economics class and you're now the Secretary Darmouth, of the Treasury. At Dartmouth. At Dartmouth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's all that matters. So you know, we tell our students all the time that the liberal arts education doesn't prepare you for a single job, but it prepares you to tackle, as we love to say, as John Sloan Dickey says, the troubles of the world. Can you reflect on your experience here at Dartmouth and how studying East Asian studies uh, prepared you to tackle something as 
difficult as the, uh, the job that you're currently in? Uh, sure. I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, what you want in education is you want to have the privilege of working with great professors who teach you how to think and how to make choices, how to make decisions. Uh, you know, I love your habits of the mind uh, framework as a way to people to think about those kind of questions. And I think that's much more important than the discipline of what you study, much more important than um, the mix of things you have. You know, I think my, 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 circ my, my life uh, so far at least has been, you know, this just continued situation over and over again of being confronted with a set of problems that we had no, frankly, idea what we were going to do to solve them. No, no playbook, no precedent, uh, no easy path. And that experience is, is something that's ultimately the most important thing. But you're much better equipped when you come to that, those, those problems if you've had the privilege I had at this great place of having people teach you the joy of discovery and the ability to think and make choices. And um, I was so fortunate to go to such a great place. And if you are as successful in sustaining that tradition here in undergraduate education in arts and sciences, then you'll have done a great thing, even, even greater than your revolution you're going to bring to healthcare delivery. <laughs> Great, we have some students over here. You said East Asia. I, sh I should just say that, you know, I, I had this other great uh, uh, privilege in life, which is I grew up overseas, and uh, my professor, Susan, Susan Blader, is sitting there and taught me Chinese uh, early in life. And, you know, I had that great uh, fortune as an American of uh, spending a huge amount of time outside the United States, looking at the United States through the eyes of others, seeing how other countries um, uh, look at the challenges facing the world, and that is a great a great privilege and a benefit. And I think one thing you can make you more optimistic about this country now is uh, that over the last 25 years, there's been a revolution in the just sheer numbers of Americans who by the time they graduate college have had that same experience. And that'll make us a much better country, much stronger, much wiser country, I think. Wonderful. Yes. Mr. Geithner, first of all, thank you so much for being here. I wanted to ask what was the main economic motivation behind the releasing of the 30 million barrels of oil in the past couple of days? And was it done to combat the oil price speculation? Or was it done as a sort of alternative quantitative easing? Or was it a purely political move? Uh, no, no, no <laughs> on, those, <laughs> on those three things. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really as simple as this. You know, there's a war in Libya cost between one and two billion, uh, million barrels a day in terms of lost output. I think 140 million barrels off the market so far. It's a type of crude affected by that that uh, not easily met by where there's spirit capacity like in Saudi Arabia. We tend to have a lot of reserves of that type of crude. Classic supply disruption. Reserves exist to help mitigate those kind of disruptions. And we helped organize a coordinated global international response to help uh, ease some of that pressure. You can think about it as like a bridge to a temporary bridge to when that additional production from Saudi Arabia that's on stream now can and uh, can make it to refineries and refineries have the time to adapt to process that in a way that meets the shortfalls you see. So that's the rationale for it. That's what the reserves exist for. And uh, if you're not prepared to use them for something like this, which is a clear, identifiable, substantial, sustained supply disruption, um, then you'd be uh, I think act not acting prudently. Great. Another question? Secretary Geithner, uh, I hate to be a pessimist, but it seems that government financial regulation. A lot of pessimists. Easy to be a pessimist today. <laughs> it seems that government financial regulation has failed to keep up with financial innovation, um, leaving our country vulnerable to those on Wall Street. So what specific rules and regulations do you believe can successfully reduce systemic risk and address the moral hazard uh, problems that our US financial system faces? Uh, excellent question. You know, we had a crisis caused by lots of different things. But uh, at its core, what happened was you had a huge increase in leverage in the financial system, people not being careful about the risks of a deep recession, fall in housing prices, didn't hold enough capital against those potential risks. And 
it was sort of worse than that in the classic sense because we allowed a whole parallel financial system to grow up, build up outside the basic protections we put in place after the Great Depression around the banking system. Uh, and when this storm hit, uh, that pile of leverage and risk just came crashing down and caused a huge amount of collateral damage to the country. And it's going to take us years still uh, to dig out and repair that damage. The most important thing you can do about that is to force institutions that are banks in the business of banking to hold more reserves, more capital, more cash, more cash cushions against the risks that are inherent in a world like ours today. They were too low. We're pushing them higher. You're going to see announced, I think, over the weekend, another wave of reforms globally to put in place more conservative constraints on, on leverage. It's really the most important thing you can do. You, you know, you can't, you'll never be able to run a system where uh, you take all the risk out of it or where you can anticipate uh, the kind of shocks, come in and preemptively diffuse them, twist a few dials to take the risk of crisis out of it. It's just not feasible. It's beyond the capacity of humans to have that understand enough about the future to do that. The only thing you can do is to make sure f the firms that operate at the core of the system, the economy depends on so much, hold more conservative shock absorbers, cushions against the inherent uncertainty of the world. And you want to make sure you can apply those constraints on the entire system. If you only apply them on one part of the system, then all you'll see happen is a whole parallel system build up again outside the banking system. You know, in our system, it was the investment banks, Fannie and Freddie, AIG to some extent, some huge uh, finance companies that were not regulated for capital. And that was a uh, catastrophic, avoidable error. And the most important thing that this new financial reform legislation does is make sure we have the authority to apply and force more conservative shock absorbers in the system as a whole. Now, at the same time, you want to make sure that investors and, and people running these institutions don't operate with the expectation the government's going to be there in the future to save them from their mistakes. And the other thing this law does is it substantially limits the discretion, the ability of the central bank, the FDIC, the government, to come in and save uh, preserve those institutions that mismanage themselves to the edge of the cliff. We have much more limited authority. That helps on the moral hazard front because it reduces the risk that, again, people uh, act rashly in the expectation it will save them from their mistakes. And, and uh, very dangerous to run a system on that expectation. You know, we're going to have our, we'll have our crises in the future. You can't take crises out of financial systems. They're inherent. But we can make them much less frequent much less severe, much less damaging, much less collateral damage to the innocent. And we have a very good chance of doing that, I think. Let me turn over here. Yes, in the middle. Secretary Geithner, um, we had Senator, former Senator Gregg here yesterday, and he advocated for the tax reform set out in Simpson-Bowles. And I was wondering if you could comment on the wisdom of reducing tax rates and tax expenditures, and also the political feasibility of getting rid of popular tax breaks like the mortgage int interest deduction. Uh, ultimately, uh, we're going to have to uh, fundamentally change large parts of the American tax system today, because as you know, and as you implied, both in the taxation of businesses and individuals, we have a system where there are, it is built, it is riddled with, stuffed with very expensive tax expenditures, deductions, loopholes, and they dis they're distortionary, uh, they're unfair. Uh, it means that bit companies in very different businesses can pay hugely different tax rates for what they earn, makes no sense. And individuals uh, face a similar sort of challenge. If you, it, oh, this is a little uh, unfair in its simplicity, but if you look at our system today, there's two huge, uh, uh, simple problems of unfairness in our current system today. On the corporate side, uh, we have very high statutory rates because we have a huge amount of expensive tax expenditures for corporations, uh, and it, it makes sense to try to change that. And we're going to propose a broader reform that we hope will bring down the statutory rate 
do it in a revenue-neutral way, improve incentives for investment in the country, and make it more fair, make, it, make people pay more even across industries. So it's not lobbyists and politicians deciding uh, what economic activity to favor on a general scale. For individuals, you know, you all live with this system. Uh, its complexity is primarily produced by this, the extent of special benefits built into the system to favor certain activities and these things like that. We want to make it more simple, but fundamentally we have to correct the biggest problem in our tax system today, which is that uh, it's just basically unfair in the structure and the burden. You know, at the, if you were um, fortunate enough to make, uh, you know, to be among the most, the richest, uh, most fortunate 0.5 percent, 1 percent Americans today, your effective tax burden, all in, is is sort of in the low 20s. Lowest it's been in decades and decades and decades. Lower than somebody who might make substantially less money. You know, Warren Buffett is a classic example. He pays less in taxes, share of income, than his, than his secretary. And there is no way we're going to uh, be able to solve our fiscal problems and preserve some room for investing in education, things like that, unless we make what are ultimately be relatively modest changes in that distribution of the tax burden. I'll, I'll say it in a different way. Uh, and I'll do it symmetrically. Even Republicans today will say, look, I'm willing to see revenues raised by changes to tax policy, but only if I am confident that those revenues are going to go to reduce the deficit, to dig our way out of this hole, not to sustain unsustainable commitments on the spending side. Uh, and we have a chance to do that now because we're going to negotiate a, a fiscal rule with a set of constraints that might offer that. Democrats say, many Democrats would say, we recognize that our commitments in health care are unsustainable. We're going to have to find a way to lower the, not just the rate of growth and costs, but uh, bring a little more gravity to those things. But I'm not going to do that. I won't do that if those savings are going to be used to sustain a tax system uh, where we have hugely expensive, very low effective rates uh, for the most fortunate Americans. So you could say, so there's a deal in there. Uh, we can find a way to do more entitlement savings, make people more ac accepting to it. If there's more shared sacrifice on the other side, we can find a way to do a little bit better burden sharing on the tax side if people are more confident it's going to go to deficit reduction. And that's basically what we're trying to negotiate. It's not, you're not going to solve it by doing things that we have to do, which is to narrow, narrow scale back the things we do for oil and gas companies or for corporate jets or the whole range of other loopholes and special privileges that are part of what we're negotiating now. Those will help, but they're going to be modest relative to the size of the problem. Uh, we're going to have to do some other things to make the system more fair and more balanced, too. But if you do this in a way that's balanced, spread across all the functions of the government, uh, it's an acceptable burden to ask people to share. If you try to do it all on a you know, narrow slice of the budget, then you'll do something that's uh, much worse for the economy, uh, even if you can let it. hard to legislate because it's just it's unfair. And if you do it, or these are big challenges, but if you do it in a way that's broad and balanced, you can do it with in a way that uh, the economy can manage. People will judge as fair. Thank you. Yes, in the middle again. Um, as a participant in formulating public economic policy, uh, and you addressed uh, fairness, uh, what is your process, or I guess the process more generally, of determining what is fair? Well, the judgment of what's fair is a, is a political judgment. Uh, it's, it's, it's what political systems decide and work out. It's, you know, why we have elections. Uh, uh, and of course, fairness is in the eye of the, of the victim <laughs> or the beneficiary. <laughs> so you're right, I was, I was using a laden term. Uh, but I'll, I'll do it in a more pragmatic or economic way. Again, uh, and there's been a good, a big, I think a really healthy improvement in the quality of debate about this on the fiscal side just over the last six months or so because you've seen a whole bunch of competing plans out there and people can look at them and say, uh, 
not just what's going to be good for the economy, what's going to be good for me, what's fair, what's going to work, what can we legislate. And that, that helps make people much more aware of the trade-offs. Ultimately, this is just a trade-off between um, you know, what you do for a range of benefits people have come to count on, uh, what you do to improve investment incentives, what's going to be fair, how much more progressive should we make the tax system. Those things are things political systems can have to resolve. But you can't do anything now without Republicans and Democrats together doing something. You can't do it just with Republicans, can't do it just with Democrats. There's sets to be compromised on both sides, and there ultimately will be compromised. And in the negotiations I've been participating in with the Vice President, uh, there's been a, you wouldn't know it from the rhetoric, but there's been a lot of uh, pragmatic, uh, realistic uh, openness to compromise. We just gotta build on that uh, so we can do something um, to help restore confidence and the ability of Washington to, you know, to do some things. But you know, you know and I, I'll, you know, this is a, again, fairness is, um, fairness is a laden thing, but it's important to be able to recognize that you know, it's not just that unemployment's 9%, uh, and you've had this huge damage to wealth and economic security caused by the crisis, but you know, I think you have one in 12 Americans on food stamps today. And I think 40% of Americans born in the United States today are, are uh, born to families where the birth is paid for by Medicaid. And you look at the quality of the outcomes we're getting in public education across the country today, you look at the quality of infrastructure in the United States today, uh, you know, we, there are things we're going to have to do uh, about these challenges that are going to cost money. They're not beyond our capacity to afford, but they require money. They require spending. It's a bad word, but it's true. Uh, so we, what the challenge we face politically is find a way to make sure we can pay for those things because we can't borrow to pay for them on the scale we've been doing. And that, that's going to force fundamental changes, uh, not just on the spending side, but it's going to gonna have to come on the revenue side, too. Other question? Yes, over here. Thank you for being here, uh, Secretary Geithner. Um, I guess I have a long-term projection sort of question. Um, you did speak of surplus. Um, I was wondering, uh, in your opinion, all things considered, uh, when do you think uh, the United States will be able to regain its surplus? Thank you. Its budget surplus? Uh, yes. You know, I, I know it sounds terrible to say it this way, but that's not the right objective for the government. You know, government is not like a family. It's not like a business, even. It's a different in that context. So we think about a family as typically having to balance its budget. And businesses over time, of course, have to generate enough revenues to do that. But for a government, it's perfectly reasonable to borrow at a modest level of income to finance things that improve the long-term growth potential of the country. And there are things governments have to do only governments can do. You know, education is one of those things. National security is one of those things. Uh, Infrastructure has a substantial public good component to it. There's a range of other things. This is your profession, not mine. Uh, and so, and it's, and in, in uh, recessions, you know, you have to run uh, deficits. You know, when the private sector pulls back in a crisis like we saw, the only way through that, you can't sit there and let it burn itself out. The only way through that is for the government temporarily uh, to expand, to borrow. So of course, over the long run, uh, you run a, you run a run uh, rough balance. So you have some room to do those kind of things. Uh, but for the next decade or so, the more modest objective we have is is the right objective, which is to get to what we call primary balance, which is your revenues balance cover your expenditures except for interest. If you do that, then the debt will start uh, declining as a share of the economy. That's the that's the right objective for the near term. Yes, uh, walk back a little bit. Let's. Mr. Secretary, are you optimistic about the near-term ability of the country to come around to, to satisfy those near-term objectives? And, and if so, what are the key components of your optimism? 
And I, I do think it's a hard time to be optimistic again, because you look at the you look at the political spectacle in Washington, and you look at the scale of challenges you face, and it does make you wonder. And you, you see that concern in how people talk about the country today, and it's and it's completely understandable, I think, given what we've been through, and given how daunting uh, these challenges look like. But I think I'm I'm fundamentally optimistic because of the following. Uh, you know, it's not just if you look back at the United States. Um, you know, as a uh, I'm going to misquote Churchill, but he said, you know, ultimately, after having explored all the alternatives, America does the right thing. It's, it's not just that, uh, and I, I think that's right, but I think most of what you see in the economy today, and most of what feels bad and dark about the American economy today, is really just the aftershocks of what caused the crisis and the damage caused by the crisis. You know, it's just the fact that we borrowed too much. Uh, people borrowed too much, there was too much leverage in the financials, and we built too many houses. Uh, huge distortion, really a lost decade in terms of choices. And we're working through those things, and we're making a lot of progress working through those things. And the, the amount of debt people have is coming down. It's still too high for them, but it's coming down. Saving rate is higher. Financial system is much stronger today. Uh, fundamentally restructured, much stronger today. You know, we're, I don't know, two-thirds of the way through the adjustment in housing, working off the housing thing that we've gone through, which is so difficult and painful for people. And, and most of the weakness you see is caused by the aftershocks of that pain uh, and crisis. And if you look at the rest of the economy less affected by those things, um, I think you should be fundamentally optimistic about the United States. You know, it's just in... in, manu in uh, Manchester, I met with a bunch of businesses, mostly small businesses and manufacturing. I think, you know, a lot of Americans wonder, do we make anything here in the United States? You know, we make a lot of things in the United States. We're very good at it. And if you look at the early shape of the recovery, exports have been really pretty strong. Private investment banks have been pretty strong. Agriculture, uh, very dynamic, innovative, productive, high tech, even, even manufacturing. People are saying for the first time in a long time, uh, Certainly many European companies, Japanese companies would say this is a much better place to run a business than anywhere else in the world. And I think that should make us fundamentally optimistic. But, you know, we'll put that at jeopardy if Washington isn't able to demonstrate to people they can come together and solve these problems, uh, not just spend their time fighting about these kind of things. You know, I'm a, I'm a, as I said, you know, having been what we're through and given what um, we lived through in the, in the, as we sort of looked into the abyss, uh, I think we should be fundamentally optimistic about what we can do as a country. We just gotta, we gotta get the political system of the country to catch up uh, to where I think average people are, what they feel. I think, you know, it's funny, I think Americans are, by history are, you know, a very confident, very optimistic, uh, fundamentally generous people, very pragmatic people. And I think most politicians don't treat Americans like that today. They treat them as if they're unable to handle you know, basic fundamental uh, changes, uh, sacrifices that I think we can handle as a country. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to sound optimistic. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll try to be optimistic. You're doing a remarkably <laughs> good job, actually. <laughs> but of course, you are paired with an economist. So it, it's sometimes it's easy. With an economist. <laughs> In deference to your time and, and how generous you've been with us today, we'll take one more question. I'm, I'm actually not getting on a plane, so if you want me to spend five more minutes, I'd be happy to do that. I'm just driving. So. Let's hope maybe that'll be If you want me to get out of here, I'd be happy to get out of here. <laughs> We've got a gentleman down here in the front. Uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Secretary. Um, as someone who witnessed the breaking down of the barriers between conventional and uh, investment banks and the Treasury during the 90s, and the subsequent consequences while you were secretary. Uh, what are the positive reasons we should continue to allow the complete marriage of investment in conventional banks, and why shouldn't there, or why shouldn't there be uh, complete legal boundaries between the two? You know, I don't, no one can know for sure that this is what I'm about to say is true, but I'll get to tell you my view on this. I, I think the, the end of Glass-Steagall, the end of the separation, had almost nothing to do with our financial crisis. Our financial crisis was caused by uh, banks, regular banks, fancy banks, investment banks, mortgage companies, 
all making a similar mistake that banks have made throughout history, which is to not uh, project into the future uh, the possibility, not prepare for the likelihood that will was be more unstable, that we'd face recessions, house prices might fall, not always rise. And that mistake was made across the American economy, across the American financial system. It's not a fancy, complicated mistake. It was made in complicated ways, but it was a simple common error. It's what rating agencies missed, what governments missed, banks missed. Uh, it's what people missed. People borrowed too much on the expectation that um, that would continue. And it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't in really any way meaningfully affected by that, that change in the basic divisions. And the solution to it is what we just discussed, and the only solution to it. And it sounds too simple, but it really is a simple solution, which is you're taking risk, the world is uncertain, you won't know how fast the economy is going to grow, how unstable growth is, how bad the next recession will be. So you run with a cushion of resources sufficient to cover the possibility of a darker outcome. And whatever you think about all the fancy, complicated stuff, derivative CDOs, uh, fancy mortgages, the basic error in everything was that simple error. And I don't know a better solution than that. Well, let me follow up. And it happened are, in are countries, it happened in countries, remember, the universal rule, uh, really, in almost all countries is complete integration of commercial investment banking. Canada, much more stable system, much more simple system, has no meaningful division, did not suffer a crisis like this. Why was that? Because they made it hard for people to borrow too much against the value of their home, and they required their banks to run more conservatively, and they only have five of them. We have 8,000. <laughs> it, it's easier to keep track. Uh, you know, the European systems uh, let their banking system grow to be massive relative to the size of our economy, much, much greater the size of our economy than ours in some ways. Had a lot of problems, in some ways much worse than ours and much farther behind ours in solving them. Uh, but it was all a similar mistake in that Fo context. Following up, maybe to ask the question in a different way, did the ability to combine those different banking entities lead to institutions that were at the time too big to fail and that may still be too big to fail? Th this like too big to fail problem, the basic moral hazard problem is uh, inherent in any financial system. And when you do what we had to do to solve this crisis, by definition the risk is you make it worse. In our, in our case, of course, we had to do all these exceptional things to hold the system together. Uh, and our system's more concentrated today, in part because we try to put as much of the burden on solving it on the private sector. So uh, banks got bigger. The ones that are stronger got bigger because they absorbed a lot of the weaker, better than the taxpayer absorbing it. But our system today is much less concentrated than any other major economy. Remember, Canada's got five banks. Uh, uh, the dominance of the s relatively few is much greater in all the other major economies. And it's worse than that because, again, their banking systems are much larger as a share of our economy. And they have no realistic prospect, really, of letting those largest institutions fail because they're a much more dominant supplier of credit. We have much more flexibility to let them fail, much less ability to save them from their mistakes because of these reforms, much more capital in the system, which will reduce the risk of failure and, and improve the odds that the rest of the system can absorb the shock uh, that comes. But all financial systems have moral hazard. There's always a risk. And if we have another crisis as severe as this one, we'll have to do exceptional things again, not to protect the institutions. And you don't do it for the banks. You do it for the innocent. And if you let it burn, and let it all come crashing down, what matters is not that people who own equity in banks lose money or that banks fail. You could say that's just. Uh, what matters is the scale of the collateral damage to the innocent. And the reason you have to do these things in a crisis that are so politically difficult, seems so unfair, is because if you don't, uh, you let it burn, you cause much more damage. Uh, and we, we uh, all countries learn that lesson um, 
by getting it wrong once or twice. Uh, and I think we got that right this time. Great. Well, you're the one who's going to cut us off, so let's <laughs> take a...